rolling. What happened on 9-11 is a phony, you know, and we've never learned the truth about 9-11. The whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be in those chips. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib. They do whatever they want to do. What we want doesn't matter anymore. It's their agenda, it's their plans that matter. They have all the money they want. They can make all the money they want. They, they have a machine that can make all the money. <laughs> it's not about money. It's about control. It's about their vision of how they want to see the world. You hear George Bush saying, democracy means freedom. No, democracy equals new world order. I believe God put me on this earth to be the best person I could be and put everybody on this earth to be the best they could be. You have to stand up for what's right in life. And unless you do that, you're nothing. Award-winning filmmaker turned freedom fighter, Aaron Russo was an amazing individual. You know, he'd been battling cancer for more than three and a half years when he began making America Freedom to Fascism that he shot, directed, edited pretty much on his own with just the help of a few people. An amazing individual. A long life of award-winning films, of hard work, and for standing up for the Bill of Rights and Constitution. You know, when we first went and shot this interview, I put it on the web for free. Uh, but parts of it have never been seen. So here today, you're going to have a chance to see the in-depth interview, the final interview with Aaron Russo. But his important work lives on. You know, he made one of the definitive films exposing the elite that control this nation and the world, the private Federal Reserve. And the information he put out two years ago rings more true today than ever. And uh, his film, America, Freedom to Fascism, and Mad as Hell, and the other great works he did, just continue like ripples in a pond uh, to light bushfires in the minds of men and women everywhere. So this film is dedicated to the one, the only, Aaron Russo. You rolling? I'm honored to be interviewed by Alex Jones, a truth seeker, fighting for justice in America. Now he's charming me. He's getting me all smiling. <laughs> Aaron, when did you start to think something was wrong in the world or start to find out about the whole banking cartel and the Federal Reserve System for the new world order? Well, that, that was a, a progression of events. Uh, I became very, I'm, I've always been a very independent person, always believed in individuality, and that we were put on this earth to be uh, unique individuals to fulfill our God-given potential, and that uh, the only way to fulfill your potential is to be free, to find out who you are, and to make errors, to make mistakes. And as I, as, uh, I grew up, I began to realize more and more the government was inhibiting me in things that I wanted to do. And uh, what happened, uh, I was very successful in the ladies' lingerie business. I worked for my dad. He had a small undergarment business. And I created the first ladies' bikini panties back in 1963, actually. And then I opened up a, um, a nightclub in Chicago called the Electric Theater uh, that, that opened up the day Martin Luther King was assassinated. Right? And so the city of Chicago was in flames the day my club opened, and nobody came out to the club. And um, well, what happened was that um, uh, that was the year of the Democratic Convention in Chicago in 68. And so my club became a hangout for the hippies, you know, because they, they wanted to go to Chicago and protest what was going on. And I was having a concert at my club one night to raise money. And uh, the police uh, raided the nightclub, my club for no reason at all. And uh, I was standing outside my, in my office looking, overlooking the street, and I saw all these paddy wagons pulling up in front of my club. And I was a 24-year-old kid. You know, I had no experience at all, really. So what are these paddy wagons doing here? And then I saw all these cops getting out of the paddy wagons coming into my club. I said, oh, my God, they're raiding me. And so uh, I ran down to the stage, and I got on the stage, and I stopped the band from playing, and I said to the people in the audience, we're being raided, you know, so uh, sit down on the floor, cooperate, you know, you know, and uh, uh, plot your identification, and cooperate with the police. And as I said that, 
uh, two of the cops from behind threw me onto the floor and grabbed me and, and started dragging me out of the club. Uh, and uh, I'm going, you know, victory, victory, you know, playing it for it was worth at the time. I was a kid. And, uh, uh, and then I saw the fire department there, and the fire department was dumping garbage cans, the garbage all over the floor. And I thought to myself, well, why are they doing that? You know, very quickly as, I was dra as they were dragging me out. And I didn't quite understand it. So they threw me into the paddy wagon. As I got into the paddy wagon, one of the cops grabbed my testicles from behind and squeezed. And I went into the paddy wagon in gigantic pain. And uh, the next person that came into the paddy wagon, the cop, as he was stepping in, the cops took the billy club, smashed him on the head with it, and just split his skull. You know, for no reason. I mean, there was nothing wrong. So that was kind of your wake-up. That was my awakening. Like, what is going on? I thought this was America. So I, I initially blamed it on Chicago and Mayor Daly. I think it was just, it was, it was Chicago. And anyway, I went on the, I went, it was the headlines of the newspapers the next day. You know, there was my picture in the newspapers, the headlines, electric theater short-circuited, it was raided. And in the article, uh, they went ahead and they said that uh, the reason they raided the club was because the fire department came there and saw it was messy full of garbage, and the hippies started attacking them, which was totally not true. Those dirty hippies? It was, yeah, it was totally false. You know, it was, it was a complete fabrication. So they ran a false flag on you. They yeah, you. Yeah, they, of course. You know, and uh, I was in shock. I said, people lie like that? People actually do these things? I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, it was an awakening to me. And I went on television, I told people on television that they lied. Nobody cared. Nobody cared what the truth was. And it was shocking to me. Um, and then a, 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 week or, a week or two weeks later, I forget exactly what it was, uh, two, two cops come to see me, a lieutenant and a, and a sergeant, a uh, captain and a sergeant. And they said, Mr. Russo, we're sorry if you got hurt that night at the club and the raid, but... Uh, we're here to tell you that if you want to keep the club open, it's going to take uh, $2,000 a month, and we're going to come see you once a month, and whenever we have to raid you, we're going to call you, you know, and we'll let you know we're going to come in tonight and raid you. This was mafia. Uh -huh. Well, the police mafia, yeah. you know. And uh, actually, it was actually, actually more interesting that they said, listen, there's the A plan, there's the B plan, and there's the super deluxe plan. And this one, of course, each one, of course, that much money a month. Which one do you want? What was I, the Super Deluxe? That's the one I took. That was a 2000 a month plan. And I took that plan, and um, I paid them $2,000 a month, and they left me alone. And whenever they were going to raid the club, they would come there, we're going to raid, we're going to have a phony raid tonight, you know, just to look good for the people in the neighborhood, you know. So that was your first big education? That was my education into corruption in government, you know. But I really thought that was basically Chicago. I didn't realize it was the whole country was like that. And so that was my wake-up call, that people lie and cheat and steal. And uh, I thought everybody was always honest and nice and decent. And uh, I had no idea about any of these things. Well, what happened with me was that they, finally one day they came to me and they said, look, we, we, we can't take your money anymore. I said, why, what's up? What's going on? I said, we have to close your club. There's elections coming. And the aldermen and the neighbor don't want you open anymore. So we can't take your money. So I had to go to court and fight them, and uh, they were trying to close the club. And then one night there was a fire, and the club never reopened again. It was, they, the club just closed, and that was the end of the club. And they, they, they burned me down. And that, that was the end of my experience. And then I moved back to New York, where I met Bette Midler, and uh, I uh, ran into her at a little uh, nightclub she was playing called The Improv. And I thought she was fabulous. And through a series of events, I began managing her. And as soon as I started managing her, her career took off like a rocket, you know, just for, fortuitous, I guess. And um, uh, we became very, very successful. And through managing Bet, I started producing shows on Broadway where I won the Tony, and I produced a television show where I won the Emmy with Dustin Hoffman and Bet, you know. And then uh, I produced The Rose for her, where she got Academy Award nominations. And then that led me to producing Trading Places, which everybody knows. You know, I think it's the best Eddie Murphy movie. Well, it's a good one. I don't know if it's the best, but it's a really good one. And I'm very proud I made that movie. And so in, in my mind, um, I feel as if I've made a classic comedy in Trading Places. 
a classic musical in The Rose, and a classic documentary in Freedom to Fascism. You know, so I'm very proud of my work that I've done as a filmmaker. Aaron, why do you do this? What's the philosophy of your life? What do you think life's all about? I think the importance of life is to like yourself. If you don't like yourself, nothing means anything. To like yourself means you have to respect yourself. To respect yourself means you have to take actions that you respect if somebody else did them. And what's the point of living if you don't like who you are? You can have all the money in the world, and if you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see there, what's the point of it? So I, to me, the most important thing is that I like who I am, and that I take actions that I would respect if somebody else did them. That you live a life of character, honesty, truthfulness, and I believe that a person has the ability to mold their character like a sculptor can mold a piece of clay. You know, there's no saying that a leopard never changes in spots. I don't believe that. I believe people have the total ability to mold their character into what they choose to be in their life, what their ideals are. And that's what I try to do with my life. I am not the same person today I was as I was 30 years ago. I've changed a lot because I wanted to be something better than what I was before. And my philosophy is that you have to like yourself, you have to be a decent person with character and integrity and honor. And that's what's important. Back in, uh, in the late 80s, I was a pretty big silver trader and gold trader. And uh, I don't think I've ever told this story on tape before. Uh, I was a pretty big silver and gold trader. And um, the, uh, I took, and I always pay my taxes, and I took what was a legal tax deduction on my silver trades. And uh, a few years later, I think it was 88 or 89 or something, the uh, IRS claimed that what I did, and other people did as well, was now illegal. We couldn't do it anymore. But they made it retroactive. I said, what do you mean retroactive? It was legal then. We did, I did what was legal. He said, yeah, but it's now we're making it illegal retroactively. And you, it, that's not good. So you owe us six hundred or $800,000. For what? It was legal. How could you make something retroactive? Change the law backwards in time. It makes no sense. Well, we're doing it. And so everybody said they can't do that. So we went to court, a class action lawsuit. And the judge agreed with the IRS and said they could do it retroactively. And that's when I knew that there was something wrong in America with the IRS and the system here. You know. Aaron, you were telling me this story last night, uh, and before you even finished saying, in the late 80s, so tax law, I said retroactive. And I knew that because they literally ruined my dad, but, but he paid. He, he didn't know. He still thought this was America. And uh, it, it was legal tax law, what you're supposed to do. They said retroactively you owe, and with... Not just retroactive, but they said you also have penalties and interest. That's right. So how do you have penalties and interest on something when they retroactively change the law? Well, first of all, you can't retroactively be, how can you, how can you do something retroactively? Penalties and interest are a farce. The whole thing, because they do whatever they want to do. And that's when I realized America is not America. It's not the land that I was taught it was. Because they can do whatever they wish to do. And there's nothing the citizen can do about it. Now, you've made America Freedom to Fascism. I want to walk through that film, and I want to encourage everybody out there to... To get a copy of it on DVD. It was also in theaters around the country, and the, I think the best film out there on the Federal Reserve and the IRS and the whole banker scam. And I want to discuss that with you here, uh, but I wanted to uh, go back a little bit uh, to the point that we discussed uh, last night, where you don't advise people to not pay, and I do the same thing. People say, "Well, wait, you're saying it's a scam, but you're saying go ahead and pay it," and I like the way you summed it up. Well, it's really fairly simple. I mean, uh, since making that movie, you know, many people come to me and ask me whether they should pay their income taxes or not, you know, and I never advise people not to pay. And the reason I, I tell them, I said, look, I've done a lot of research. There isn't, the Supreme Court has ruled that the IRS has no authority. The 16th Amendment did not give the IRS the authority to tax your labor and your wages. That's a fact, all right? The Supreme Court is the law of the land, they, you know? And the, and, the, and the IRS does not trump the Supreme Court. However, that being the case, the fact is if the mafia would come to you and say, we want $2,000 a month that we're going to hurt you, I would not advise you not to pay them because you may get hurt by not paying them. Whether it's legal or not doesn't necessarily matter. You're going to get hurt if you don't. It's the same thing with the IRS. 
They can hurt you. They can put you in jail. They can torture you. So if you don't pay them, you may get hurt. So I never advise people not to pay. You know, I tell people, yeah, pay your taxes. Look what happened to but, Congressman Hanson. Yeah, Congressman Hanson's a great example. Pay your taxes. But you know what? Shut down the Federal Reserve System, and eventually you won't have to pay those taxes anymore. See, the, the, the IRS is a symptom of the problem. The real problem the, is the banking industry and the bankers in this country. That's where the real problem lies. That's the root of our problem. Well, that's why we've lost America, okay? So, yeah, pay your taxes, because if you don't pay them, you might get hurt. And I've heard all the arguments, you know, uh, how, what tax protesters say and so on and so forth. And I don't call them tax protesters. I call them the tax honesty movement, because they're being honest, you know, at least. But the fact of the matter is, you, you're being forced, you're being compelled to pay it because you're facing jail sentences, you're facing time, you're facing corruption of the courts if you don't pay, right? And so you pay it, because you just like you pay the mafia. But with the mafia, at least you have the government to call and try and help you to get past the mafia, to protect you. Here you have nobody to, pr to protect you. The, the, the American people are living in a matrix. They don't understand the truth of how things are working in this country, you know? And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The very fact is that if you, if you ask 100 people on the street, what kind of government is America supposed to be? 99% of them will tell you a democracy. America is supposed to be a democracy. But that's a lie. That's an illusion. The word democracy is not written into the Constitution at one time. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in the Declaration of Independence. The Founding Fathers hated the idea of a democracy. They thought it was the worst form of government there is. And I agree with them. Because in a democracy, 51% of the people control 49% of the people. If you're part of the 49%, you're not free. America was founded as a constitutional republic. And in that constitutional republic that we have, 99% of the people can't take away the rights of 1%. You have your rights because you were born with them. You have God-given human rights that nobody can take away from you. The government, the majority, no matter who they are, I can't take away your rights. And that's what, that's, that's what our founding fathers gave us. But the psychological operations that they, that they do to us, they make us believe that we're a democracy and that majority rules. You see? And they want you to believe that. Because then they tell you, this poll says, this many want this, and this many want that, and this many want this. And it doesn't have anything to do with anything. Well, Hitler was elected. Hitler was elected. Hitler did everything legally. And in a re constitutional republic, a minority is, pro is protected against a majority. Wasn't it Benjamin Franklin, a paraphrase, that said, democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner? Exactly. And then he also said, in a republic, the sheep would have a gun. <laughs> <laughs> to protect himself, you know, and that's, that's, that's the truth. America's not a democracy, but you ask the most intelligent people what form of government America's supposed to be, they'll say democracy. Because that's, what, that's what they've been brainwashed. They've been psyoped into believing that. They believe that we're in Iraq. They believe we're in Iraq to promote democracy. The word democracy, you hear George Bush saying democracy means freedom. No. Democracy equals new world order. Democracy equals slavery. The word democracy is not synonymous with freedom. It's the opposite of freedom. Democracy is the worst form of government you can have because it's majority rule. And the government can tell you exactly what they want to tell you to do. Because the majority wants it. I don't care what the majority wants. I live my life as I choose. And if I don't commit violence, theft, or fraud against another human being, I can live my life as I wish. That's my choice. And if I'm allowed to make mistakes, because when you make mistakes, you learn from them. You grow as a human being. We're put on this earth to become the best individuals we can be, to fulfill our God-given potential, right? We're not here to put on this earth so that the government can tell us how to live our lives and what we must do. We put into these systems and these paradigms. No. The same thing in health. You, you know, if you're sick, you have to have a certain protocol. Nonsense. You know, be individuals. Think for yourself. Have critical thinking, you know. And so what's happened is that because they've taught everybody that we're a democracy, which is not true, now, so then in 1913, they bring the Federal Reserve System into being, right? And now you have this Federal Reserve System, which then in 1913 got the right to create money for the government, when before that, the government created its own money. 
Now, now the government, when it needed money, had to borrow it from this private bank called the Federal Reserve, which is a private bank owned by individuals, incorporated in Delaware. And so um, what happens is now the government borrows money from them to fund the government. Then the government says, well, we have to pay these people interest. How are we going to pay them interest? Let's impose a tax on the labor of the American people, which never existed before, to pay the interest to the bankers. In fact, in 1980, Ronald Reagan said not one red cent uh, of your income tax money goes to run the country. It all goes to the Federal Reserve. Well, it, go, what the, it was the Grace Commission report that said that uh, all the, not one nickel goes to the infrastructure of the country. You know, uh, I guess Reagan quoted that. Then, right. So. And so, um, but the point, the, point, the point I'm trying to make is that by creating this Federal Reserve system, the government now became dependent on these private banks for money. And they started take, taxing us, you see. And so now, now what happens is that um, in 35, I believe it was, Social Security started. And they gave you Social Security cards, said not to be used for identification, the Social Security number right on the card, right? And through Social Security, they started deducting money out of your, out of your paycheck. That was the first time they were ever take, could take money out of your paycheck because people agreed to it because they thought it was going to the retirement fund. And so then when they instituted the income tax again, they started taking money out of your paycheck because Social Security could do it. And then, then they could do it again. You see what I'm saying? And so now they've even taken control of the tax, the, the tax payment itself. I mean, literally like you're a slave, they're right. taking it right there when you make it. Exactly. They don't even trust the public enough to, to go send them a check. Themselves, you know? Right. So they take it out automatically because they know people aren't going to want to pay it. So what's happened is that through the implementation of the Federal Reserve System, the government has become uh, vested in these bankers, and they get their money from the bankers. And so then they impose a tax on us, which makes us more slaves, makes it more difficult for us to survive, right, giving them more profits. And now what's happened is that uh, through the, the, the Federal Reserve System, the bankers have pretty much taken control of our government. It doesn't matter Republican and Democrat anymore because they're both the same. Neither one of them are talking about shutting down the Federal Reserve System or stopping the payment of taxes, you know, uh, or any of the big issues that face Americans, right? So uh, I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, okay, who's one of the Rockefeller family, and he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney, and uh, we became friends. We started talking about things, and um, I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish. And the goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks. And they're, and they're all part of the Communist Manifesto. You know, central banking is one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talk about America being a capitalistic country. But yet, at the same time, we have a central bank that plans everything for us, right? And the graduated income tax is another plank of the Communist Manifesto, right? So right there, you have two major planks of the Communist Manifesto that have been brought in because of the Federal Reserve System, okay? So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one-world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers. Where, and, and they're doing it in sections. The, the European currency, the euro, and, and the European constitution is one part of it. Now they're trying to do it in America with the North American Union, right? And they want to create a new currency called the Amero, right? And uh, the, whole, the, the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an, R, R, an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be. Um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, anytime you have money in your, in your, in your chip, 
they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. And you have nothing. You can't buy food. You can't do anything. It's total control of the people. And that chip's connected to a database that has your purchasing records, what you do, what Everything. You everything is in there, you know? And so they, they want a one-world government controlled by them, everybody being chipped, all your money in those chips, and they control the chips, and they control people. And you become a slave. You become a serf to these people. That's their goal. That's their intentions. More than a decade ago, I began getting secret government documents, and we published them, where the feds were training uh, the local police uh, and the military that gun owners, conservatives, people that made frequent references to the U.S. Constitution were terrorists. That's a quote. But in 2009, it broke into the national media when we received uh, the secret MIAC report from a state police officer. Um, and that was in the state of Missouri, but the feds had written it, demonizing Ron Paul, people that wanted to end the Federal Reserve, people that wanted liberty and freedom. And now more secret reports have been released, like the Department of Homeland Security report, which the feds admit they wrote, that says returning veterans are the number one terror threat in America, that gun owners uh, are part of that number one threat, that people buying ammo are the number one threat. Think about this. You have these private bankers overthrowing the United States, and they're secretly training the police that gun owners and patriots and veterans are the number one threat. So they're saying the American people that follow the Constitution and Bill of Rights that will actually stand up against this tyranny are terrorists because they are the terrorists. They are the criminals coming in with a corporate takeover, a hijacking of the nation. Eric, can you be specific about when you met Rockefeller, how it happened in these discussions? Uh, I met Rockefeller through a female attorney I knew who called me up one day and said, uh, one of the Rockefellers would like to meet you. I had made a video called Mad as Hell, and uh, he'd seen the video and wanted to meet me and knew I was running for governor of Nevada. So sure, I'd love to meet him. And I met him, and I liked him, and uh, uh, he was a very, very smart man. And uh, we used to talk and share ideas and thoughts. And um, he's the one who told me uh, 11 months before 9-11 ever happened that there was going to be an event Never told me what the event was going to be, but there was going to be an event, and out of that event, uh, we were going to invade Afghanistan to run uh, pipelines from the Caspian Sea. We were going to invade Iraq, you know, to take over the oil fields, establish a base in the Middle East, and make it all part of the New World Order, and we'd go after Chavez in Venezuela. And uh, sure enough, later, 9-11 happened, and I remember he was telling me how <laughs> how you're going to see soldiers looking in caves for people in, in uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and all these places and, it's, and there's going to be this war on terror uh, which is no real enemy and the whole thing is a giant hoax you know but it's a way for the government to take over the American people he told you it was going to be a hoax oh yeah oh yeah there's no question he says there's going to be war on terror and he's just laughing there's no, <laughs> who are we fighting? I mean, why do you think 9-11 happened and then nothing's happened since then? Do you think that our security is so great here that these people who pulled off 9-11 who were able to, can't knock down another plane? Come on, it's ridiculous. 9-11 was done by people in our own government and our own banking system to perpetuate the fear of the American people into subordinating themselves to anything the government wants them to do. That's what it's about, and to create this, war, this endless war on terror. And, that's why we, and that was the first lie. And the next lie was going into Iraq, you know, uh, to uh, get Saddam Hussein out with his weapons of mass destruction. That was the next lie. Now, now specifically, this was a little over six years ago? This was... Uh, 11 months before 9-11. Yeah. And Nick Rockefeller, he's a lawyer, he is, he, he's become your friend over the previous years, and he's saying to you that there's going to be this big event, and then out of that we're going to have a war on terror, and it's just going to go on and on. Right. An endless war on terror without, without any real enemy. That you can never, so you can never define a winner. And, and did, uh, did he say that it's going to be perfect because you can't define an enemy? It just goes yeah, because on on. you can't define a winner. There's no one who's going to beat, so it goes on and on forever. And they can do whatever they want. They scare the hell out of the American public. 
Look, this whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. It's very difficult to say it out loud because people are intimidated against saying it. Because if you say it, they want to make you into a nutcase. Let's but the this. truth, but the truth has to be, the truth has to come out. That's why I'm doing this interview. The fact of the matter happens to be that the whole war on terror is a fraud. It's a farce. Yet yeah, there's a war going on in Iraq because we invaded Iraq and people over there fighting, you know. But the war on terror, it's a joke, you know. And until we discover what really happened on 9-11 and who was responsible for 9-11, because that's where the war on terror emanates from. That's where it comes from. It was 9-11 that allowed this war on terror to begin. And until we get to the bottom root of 9-11, the truth of 9-11, we'll never know about the war on terror. Aaron, you said that he was, and I think it's important, and I know this about the Rockefellers from Dr. Dennis Cuddy and many others, he literally, you'll be 20 years old in a lunch line at college, and no, it's David Rockefeller. And he hears here, I mean, they're experts at recruiting and getting what they call players, and that clearly he was, he, I mean, I want to make it specific and just get you to reiterate what you said last night uh, about you were, you got 30% of the vote, you were having an effect, you, you, you made mad as hell, they knew that you'd started the Constitution Party, yeah. they knew that you were uh, somebody who was taking action and getting things done, you'd already made some big films, had a lot of other successes, right. so they were trying to recruit you, and, and, and didn't it come down to the point of, hey, we are here to recruit you, and don't worry, your chip's going to say, don't mess with us, you know, this guy's, uh, don't touch. Yeah, uh, yes, that did happen, now, I was definitely being recruited. But it's more subtle than that. Well, your words. Just go through the process, and then, and then what do you say? Well, well, what it is is, I remember, we were friends, and we used to have, he used to come to my house a lot. We'd have dinner, we'd talk, and he'd, he'd tell me about business investments that he'd get involved in, you know, or they would help me with this business investment or that business investment. And was I interested in joining the Council on Foreign Relations? You know, I would have to get a letter to join them, but was I interested in that? And, uh, you know, just, uh, just stuff, you know, leading you on. And, and uh, I, I used to say to him that I never really did that because well, that wasn't where I was coming from. You know, as much as I like you, Nick, you know, your ways and my ways, we're, the, we're on the opposite side of the fence. You know, I don't believe in enslaving people, you know, and... Um, and he would come back with, oh, I do? Well, it would be more like, you it's know... It's better for them, well, it's more like, you know, um, how do I put it? It was like, what do you care about them? What do you care about those people? What difference does it make to you? Take care of your own life. Do the best you can for you and your family. What do the rest of the people mean to you? They don't mean anything to you. They're just serfs. They're just people. You know, it was, it was just a lack of caring, you know, and that's just not who I was. It was just, it was just sort of like cold, you know, it was just like cold, you know, and uh, I said, what, what's the point of all this? You have all the money in the world you need, you have all the power you need, what's the point? You know, what's the end goal? And he said the end goal is to get everybody chipped, to control the whole society, to have the, to have the bankers, the, the elite people, you know, the bankers and some governor controlling the world. And, and, and I said, oh, do all the people in the Council on Foreign Relations believe this way you do? He said, no, no, no. You know, it, 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 most of them believe they're doing the right thing. A lot of them believe it's better, it's better off being socialistic. You know, we have to convince people that capitalism, that socialism is really capitalism. Because America's becoming a socialist country. It's a communist country today. And here we are, years later, after Aaron Russo points out that this is not a capitalist or free market country but is really socialist. In fact, here's the cover of Newsweek. We are all socialists now. But this isn't the socialism the public thinks it is, where the government robs from the rich to give to the poor. Actually, it's always the big banks, the elites throughout history that fund socialism. They want to use the middle class's money uh, to basically domesticate the working class and expand the size of government so it can basically, in the end game, eradicate the middle class and have a giant sub-mass of uneducated slaves who have no chance of ever rebelling against the tyranny and a tiny elite in control of it all. And that is the very nature of this New World Order system. They are using big government to strangle competition, to uh, take control of the people, to break up the family to basically set up a global plantation or neo-feudalist state. 
Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he brought, we were, he was at the house one night, and uh, we were talking, he was talking, and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I had pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want me, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded Women's Lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He says, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before Women's Lib. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. So it breaks up the family. The, the, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's love, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. Uh, yeah. Aaron, did you know that Gloria Steinem, in one of her own books, now admits the CIA funded Miss Magazine? No, I had no idea about that. No, I never heard that. Yeah, we're gonna the CIA funded Miss Magazine? Funded Miss Magazine with the stated goal of taxing women and breaking up the family. No kidding. I never heard that. Well, Nick told me. I mean, I mean, I know it, but not because I know the CIA was involved in it. Well, she, Gloria Steinem was proud of it. Oh, the CIA wanted to help me help women. No and kidding. So they funded it, yeah. And, and of course, it's divide and conquer. Right, And, and of course. what they do is they focus in, obviously, on real problems. Women were getting shafted in many ways, but the elite didn't, wasn't planning to help them. They were planning to really shaft them and take men away from them. Look at what they did with black families. You only had about 10% illegitimacy 50 years ago uh, in black communities, and now it's over 90%. And look at welfare. You were going to give me some money, but you can't have a man in the house. Right. And, and so that was further to degrade the family. Damn. Totally destroyed. Uh, and, and, and now illegitimacy is over 50% in the general population. Right. Well, see, the whole thing is, is the, these people control the money, so they make all the rules, you understand? And, and they put whatever rules they want into effect. And the truth is America has really become a socialist, communist country. And nobody, everybody says it's a capitalist country. It's not a capitalist country. You know, how can it be capitalistic when you have a central bank? <laughs> That's the first, you can't, it can't be, you know? The it's money, a plan to come it's a plan to kind. It's, it's a phony. If they want to create prosperity, they just print dollars. They just make dollars or put digits into the economy. And, they, and then now you have prosperity. You don't have real prosperity. You don't have real manufacturing. You just have, you just have money being injected in. It's an infusion of credit. Which only being, makes the government go into more debt. Into more debt. Fair Reserve is poison to our country. Of course it is. It's poison. Whoever makes the money makes the rules. Rothschild said that, and they make the money. Why are we allowing these private bankers to make the money for our country? It makes no sense. Why are we paying interest to these banks to make money for us when the government can do it itself without paying interest and without all that debt? There's no answer to that question, and it's the question no politician will raise. Everybody talks about America's debt, how much debt we're in. We're in debt because we have to borrow money. But we don't have to borrow money. They designed it so we go into debt. Exactly. We can create the money and back it by gold so, have, so they can't create too much of it. So you don't have the inflation. And then do what the founding fathers gave us. But instead, the bankers make the money. They control the government. They buy the politicians. They tell us who gets into office. You have computer voting. That's a fraud. They do whatever they want to do to us. They do whatever they want to do to us. And it has to stop. My friendship with Nick Rockefeller was one where we, were, uh, we expressed ideas to each other and thoughts and philosophies, and he wanted me to become part of what they were doing and for me to become a member of the CFR and uh, offered various business opportunities for me to get involved in and for me to um, not take up the fight or the battle that I've been taking up in the past, you know, to drop that idea because what was the point of my fighting for the people? I was a guy who was very successful in the movie business, and I saw the truth of what was happening. I tried to express it to the people, 
And rather than having me express it to the people, they wanted me to join their side because I was a mover and a shaker. And rather than me opposing them, to join them. It was real simple. And uh, he tried to recruit me into that situation. And um, I didn't go for it. Did he get angry when you didn't go for it? No, no. And, uh, you know, it was like, you know, I remember one time he said to me, you join us, so you, so you have an ID card, Aaron, you know, you have a chip, and your chip will say KMA on it. And uh, I said, what does KMA mean? He said, it means kiss my ass. <laughs> and anybody stops you, a cop or whatever, and you show them your card or your chip, and uh, they'll, they'll not leave you alone because you're one of us.